All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Benjamin, and welcome to a video I'm doing on the double barrel Senate election in the state of Georgia. And, you know, this race does have a little bit of meaning towards me. Um, you know, I'll, I really do like the state of Georgia. It's a great, fantastic state. And it's, you know, it's just, there's some absolutely beautiful parts. Um, you know, you go down south Georgia and, you know, towards the coast, you've got some beautiful beaches and you got some great fields and all that. And then you go to north Georgia and you got the mountains and, you know, you've got Stone Mountain, which is absolutely stunning. Um, and, of course, there's the Atlanta suburbs. And some, some of them are extremely nice. A lot of them are. Uh, you got Coweta, you got Fayetteville, you got Peachtree City. Um, of course, I prefer the mountains, but you know I, I love mountains to begin with. <laughs> I live in some mountains. Um, <laughs> but anyway, a lot of people are talking about how, oh my God, the Democrats might actually win one of these two elections, or that one is more inherently more competitive than the other, and I vehemently disagree with that because at the end of the day double barrel senate elections tend to go the same direction we saw that in minnesota um, with tina smith and uh, amy klobuchar in 2018 similar thing in mississippi uh, trying to remember a few others from recent memory but there's I think maybe two or three instances where a double barrel Senate election has produced a split result. And most of those were either from way back in the day. I'm talking, you know, 30s, 40s, you know, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, I think one of the two Senate elections from when Alaska and Hawaii were first admitted into the United States, one of those produced a split decision. I think there was a very unique situation um, in the 80s or 90s, maybe early 2000s, where there was a double barrel Senate election that produced a split result. Now, talking about this double barrel Senate election, we do have the very popular David Perdue, who is a well-known popular incumbent running in his normal re-election, or, you know, in the normal election for his Senate seat. And then you have the rather unpopular Kelly Lawfer, who is currently undergoing some problems due to her potential insider trading scandal. Um, and there are quite a few other Republicans, uh, Tom Tillis, uh, sorry, Tom Tillis in North Carolina is kind of being sunk by that, even though we don't know if he did, um. The other North Carolina Senator Barr, um, he's ha he has a few problems, and there's one or two others, and of course Senator Feinstein in California, but she's never gonna she's never gonna be weaker. Um, now I will state that Georgia is becoming a lot more competitive. Um, if we go ahead, eh, I won't add a toss up category, but uh, you know basically. Um, I'm going to highlight where this election will be won or lost for both parties. Actually, eh, Fulton is basically dead safe. Um, some of the uh, some of the Savannah area will also come into play in some regard. But in reality, this is those are you know the counties where um, the, both Senate races will be won and lost, and the Atlanta suburbs are still pretty darned red. You know, Fayette County and Fayetteville, you know, they're pretty red. Um, the northern, you know, northeastern suburbs of Atlanta, they're still extremely red. Uh, but there is a shift towards the Democratic Party, and, you know, that isn't unexpected, that isn't unknown, and it's, generally speaking, 
a baked in trend to an extent. However, at the end of the day, 2020 is not like 2018. Uh, both Senate seats are, while they'll probably produce what looks to be a competitive result, uh, this is kind of a blanket truth around the South. Um, treat a two to three point victory in the South for either party as a five to six point win in other, basically every other state. Uh, and that's partially because Southern voters are split almost exclusively along racial lines. If you're white, chances are you're voting for the GOP. If you're black, you're probably voting for the Democratic Party. And the South has a very high portion of African American voters. And it's, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to be winning in the suburbs where there are actually some level of swing voters. That's why a lot of people like to classify southern swing states as what's known as toss-up, uh, not toss-up, sorry, as turnout swing states, where it's more important to drive out your base and to actually get your base to turn up to vote, to turn out, so to speak. So if the Republicans absolutely flub turnout, which I doubt will happen in a presidential election year, both seats should, at the end of the day, go to the Republican candidates by, I'd say, about 5 to 6, maybe 7 or 8 percent. Now, I do expect some small amount of split ticket voting um, because Donald Trump isn't exactly the best candidate for the South. Um, part of it's his... Uh, New York attitude, so to speak. Um, so I do expect some split ticket voting where, you know, some people will vote for the Democratic candidate at the top of the ticket, but will vote for, say, a uh, David Perdue. Um, I don't expect Kelly Lawford to make it out of the jungle primary in the special election. Um, I believe Collins is more likely to face up against the eventual Democrat and he that's pretty much going to be a layup in the runoff election. Um, because, well, without Lawfer, there's no easy target for the Democrats to attack. And if Lawfer is the one, I could actually see that one with the right Democratic candidate being the... I could see that one producing a split result. And that's based entirely off of the nature of jungle primaries in the South because you need to have a clear majority to not need a runoff election. Um, and if you add up the both Lawfer and uh, Collins, their support base, um, they are polling well ahead of the top Democratic candidate and all Democratic candidates combined. So... Again, this is just one of those races. I really don't un understand why people are saying one's more competitive than the other. I mean, there is the outside ch chance that Lawford does win the primary, but uh, or at least win the uh, come in the top two in the jungle primary. But I highly doubt it. Um, she's probably going to come third because the Democrats are uniting around one candidate in particular. I forget his name, and I literally just looked at it. Um, so, I, so to maintain some level of professionalism, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> move in the. Uh, I'm not going to slide to the. Uh, I'm not going to look it up again. But you know, so that's kind of my thoughts there, and I I I just don't real I don't really see either of these seats as pickup opportunities for the Democratic Party, and I'll go ahead and use this as a quick little time to uh, show you what my thoughts on the Senate as a whole are going to be. Um, I'm actually putting both uh, Georgia races in the likely category. This is based off of confidence, remember. This is not based off of what I think the actual vote margins are going to be. Because I think those are t a little too fluky um, in order to accurately reflect what's going to happen. Um, Minnesota should be safe. 
Uh, actually, Minnesota is very interesting. I'll probably do a, a video on that one. But Tina Smith probably won't lose. Um, Massachusetts is going to be safe. Rhode Island is going to be safe. New Jersey, Delaware is absolutely is going to be safe at this point. Um, West Virginia is going to be safe. Anybody who says that Kentucky is anything less than safe has got another thing coming. Uh, Senate races are much more competitive. Uh, sorry, much more nationalized than governors' races. And a lot of people are using Bashir's win in Kentucky is saying, hey, Mitch McConnell might be vulnerable. He's not. Period. He is not vulnerable in that seat. Unless it turns out that he was insider trading, and even then that might only push it into the likely category. I'm that confident in his ability to win in Kentucky. It's just that red at the Senate and presidential level, at the federal level. We're talking about in a wonderful environment for House Democrats and for Democratic candidates for the House of Representatives. They couldn't even pick up the one toss-up seat in Kentucky. Okay, that's just not happening. I also think Cornyn is all but safe in Texas. Um, he's He's got a slightly better net approval than Ted Cruz. Remember, Ted Cruz is also... And Beto O'Rourke is also not running for a Senate seat, so there's a less than stellar cast of Democratic candidates running for that seat. And I just, I really don't see that seat flipping at all, I, even in, under the best Democratic circumstances. And I am 100% certain that Doug Jones is going to lose his seat. Mark Warner is, for all intents and purposes, safe. However, it's going to look competitive, okay? Uh, Joni Ernst should do well in Iowa. Um, I'm putting this into the lean category because I can see a few scenarios in which she could lose, but they most of the time involve the idea, or they most of the time involve uh, Donald Trump losing the presidency so bad that he loses Iowa, which is becoming, I, I really don't think Iowa's going to be all that in play. Uh, similar story in Ohio. I really don't see that as in play unless things get significantly worse with COVID. Um, we go, to, and that already puts Republicans at 50, um, which means all they need to do is win the White House, and they've got control of the Senate for uh, at least two years. And at that point, it might actually flip. Um, by the way, if the Democrats win the presidency, they can kiss goodbye of the Senate until 2032. And I genuinely mean that. And I may do an extended video explaining why that is. Because they're not going to maintain the Senate. The, if they manage to lose the Senate, which I actually think they're going to in 2020, and yet still win the presidency, they won't ha even have control of the, they won't have control of the Senate until 2032 at best, and it's not going to look good. <laughs> it's going to be much harder for them to pass through a lot of their policy goals, um, especially the more progressive slash. Uh, more uh, Bernie Sanders-esque proposals. I doubt they could even get a public option pushed through. Um, New Mexico, I'm putting in the lean category simply because it's an open seat election, even though there is a popular incumbent retiring in Tom Udall. Um, and New Mexico is just not really... And it's not really a super competitive state uh, at the federal level anyway. Um... If they could get a strong candidate in New Mexico, the Republicans might actually be able to flip this if Trump landslides, but I, I really don't see it. But I could see it becoming competitive with the correct candidate um, in the Senate. So let's go to Colorado, which I'm also putting in the lean category because Cory Gardner does have some level of incumbency advantage, and if Hickenlooper doesn't win the primary there, for the Senate seat, I just honestly do not expect, uh, I expect it to be much closer. If Hickenlooper wins, I'm going to put that, uh, wins the Democratic primary there. I'm going to put it in the uh, likely category because Hickenlooper is pretty strong um, in Colorado. But if 
he doesn't. Corey Gardner just has a name recognition advantage. It probably won't help the fact that Colorado is, for all intents, becoming a blue state. But it does give him a little bit better chance of keeping that Senate seat. Arizona, as much as I don't like saying this, I think I'm t- I'm tilting it towards the Democrats. Um, we might actually see a split result. Um, I do have Arizona's leaning towards the GOP presidentially. But McSally is a weak candidate. Um, even though she only narrowly lost to Kirsten Cinema in 2018, she is not performing well against Mark Kelly, whom should be an easy layup for any Republican to beat. Because Mark Kelly, even though he's you know a fairly popular figure and an astronaut and all that, with good name recognition. He has a problem that, even in a lean's red state, should signal the death of any campaign, and that's that he's almost as bad on guns as Michael Bloomberg. And that should kill his candidacy. It really should. But that just goes to show you how weak of a candidate McSally is. And if any, if she wins, it's because Donald Trump dragged her to that win, not because she not because she won on her own, okay? And, you know, it's just the way I see it. Um, Michigan is interesting. And, again, it's one of those states, in some situations I could see it producing a split result between the presidency and the Senate race. Um because, of course, Gary Peters is the incumbent, and if Donald Trump wins the state, Gary Peters is, is probably still has a slight edge. But John James could also win this, even if Donald Trump loses the state of Michigan, because John James is a fairly strong candidate. He beat his polls by, I think it was like 3 to 4% in 2018 over a very popular incumbent in Debbie Stabenow in a Democratic-favoring year. And he made it much more competitive than I think anybody expected it to. And, of course, John James is very much running in that Trump mold. And he is, you know, an Army veteran, you know, a small businessman. And he he ticks all the boxes the Republicans could ever hope to have in a candidate challenging an, uh, an incumbent. And Gary Peters does not have the same strengths as Stabenow in that his name recognition is not very high, in that there's a lot of room for public opinion to shift on him because there's a lot of uh, people who don't know whether or not they approve, disapprove of the job Gary Peters is doing in the Senate. And of course it is a presidential election year. And John James, again, is a very strong candidate. He's basically been running for the seat since he lost in uh, 2018 to Stabenow. And he hasn't really lost the name recognition. He might actually have more name recognition in Michigan than uh, Gary Peters. And that will certainly help him. Um, But for right now, um, because I still expect Michigan to go blue at the presidential level, I am giving a uh, a very slight edge to Gary Peters as the incumbent. Um, Things can definitely change, and I honestly wouldn't be too surprised if they do. I don't really think Shaheen is too vulnerable. She'll probably beat uh, Biden in New Hampshire in terms of the Senate vote versus the presidential vote because New Hampshire should be an extremely competitive state presidentially. Senate-wise, she's a fairly popular incumbent, and I don't really see a very strong challenger uh, on the Republican side coming up and beating her. Suzanne Collins... This is a tough one. Suzanne Collins in Maine. She has... Her approval rating in the state has plummeted. And... Maine is very unique, but they're also using the single transferable vote, the instant runoff voting uh, as well. And that might benefit the Democrats because she has often had a third-party challenger that has taken away 
from the Democratic voter base. But then again, we don't actually know. She's held the seat for a very long time. She is a good fit for Maine, but some of her votes have uh, have put into question whether or not uh, she's going to maintain the support of the people of Maine. I think she still has a slight, slight, slight edge, but it's it's going to be a competitive race, and I wouldn't be too shocked to see that uh, Senate seat go blue. And North Carolina. Tillis is not a not the strongest candidate, but I've yet to hear a strong Democratic challenger uh, come up against him. And, of course, North Carolina is like Georgia. It's a turnout state, and it is a state that if you turn out your base, it doesn't matter what the other party does. It doesn't matter how many... Um, independents and swing voters they flip to their side if you turn out your base you'll still probably win if you are the party that has the edge and in the case and in North Carolina that is going to be the GOP it's not as significant as it was say in 2014 or two you know in 2014, 2010, uh, you know, some of the other Senate elections. But it still exists, but it is becoming a much closer state. Um, Virginia is similar in that regard, except the Democrats have the edge in partisanship now. Um, so I'm tilting this state to the Republicans, but Tillis is a weak candidate, and again, it could produce a split result. Um, but even though I started focusing on the double barrel election in Georgia, um, I decided to explain where I personally felt the Senate map was looking. Anyway, I want to thank all y'all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see y'all next time. Take it easy.